Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the NoDiceNoGlory.com roundtable for the Historical Miniature Gaming Society's CyberCon. Um, I am your moderator, Tom Mullane. I am joined by uh, Glenn Van Meter and Tyler Stone from Tales of the Sale. Say hello. Um, and also our main uh, questioner, asker, is going to be Joseph Forrester from the Blood and Pigment blog. So say hello, Joe. Hi. Main interrogator. Today, uh, broadcasting live from a secure, undisclosed location aboard what we presume is a pirate sloop is uh, Mike Tunes from Firelock Games. Give him a wave. everybody. Um, so please make sure that you guys have your uh, cameras off and microphones muted. It helps with the bandwidth. Um, if you guys have questions, as, um, as Joseph's asking questions of Sean, uh, of, of Mike rather, uh, go ahead and type them in chat and um, what, what I'll do is I'm gonna be kind of collating the questions off in the background so that they can kind of address them um, as, they, as they come up. So just go ahead and type them and we will do our best to get to as many questions from Mike as we can get. Um, so we wanna thank Mike for his time today uh, and be aware if you are tuning in for the beginning of this um, or if you, you came in late, there will be a recording of it posted up on YouTube um, on the Nerdest of Glory account. So even if you weren't able to uh, see the whole thing, or if you have to cut out early, you'll be able to, to get the, the whole thing. Um, probably later this evening, if, if Mitch is fast enough. And Mitch is generally pretty fast. Um, so, so Joseph, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Thanks for letting me be here. Um, first, I just want to congratulate Mr. Tunez for keeping the company alive during this year. <laughs> probably hasn't been exactly what you planned. Eh? Thank you. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you guys are doing okay down there. Could be worse. So we're doing all right. <laughs> you guys have already released a lot this year. And it looks like you have a lot more on your plate that I have a little bit of knowledge of. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you have planned for the next few months. Yeah, that reminds me. Let me start. Let me open up my um, documents here. So I'm ready to go on anything you ask me. Go ahead. Carry on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so you already released... Actually, this calendar year released the um, Oak and Iron corset and related material. Um, how has that been received? Really good so far. I'm very happy with how it's been received for the most part. Um, it's um, it's been uh, it didn't come out quite to uh, the world I'd hoped it would. <laughs> <laughs> that so, a... I mean, not only did we have I mean mountains of issues with the shipping company that we hired, unfortunately. Um, that we will certainly not be using uh, a second time. Um, but so not only did we have just tons of issues with that, then by the time everything, everything actually landed, the world was on lockdown, right? So it's, we were, we had all these plans. We had organized play ready to go. We had conventions, we had events, we had just all this stuff ready to go and just dead on arrival with all those things, unfortunately. Thankfully, the saving grace, of course, as you know, is the uh, tabletop simulator. Um, it's not the best way to play Oak and Iron, but it's something. And it allowed us to start kind of creating a fledgling community of people who are excited and, and interested in playing the game, even though we couldn't all meet together in person and do so. But, uh, but other than that, the people who have actually received it and had the chance to actually play it seem to be giving us tremendous feedback on how much they're enjoying it. So it's gone, it's gone well in that regard. Yeah, as a player involved in that campaign, it looks like it gave you a good, really concentrated core of feedback and yes, testing of the game. It was a lot of fun. So thanks for organizing that. I appreciate it. Thanks for playing and for helping too. So. Us Spanish didn't win, but we we did our best. <laughs> well, I could, you know, I think we won at heart. Uh, remind me your win Ross ratio again. <laughs> you know, decent. <laughs> I want to hear the number. I want to hear the number. <laughs> you know the number. You don't have to have me remind you of that. <laughs> Everyone else wants to know that. Okay, moving on. <laughs> um, are we gonna? Are we expecting any new releases for Oak and Iron in the foreseeable future, or is that just something that will happen? Hang on, hang on one second. I have coffee delivery. Uh, thank you. All right. It's got a what a life on a boat getting coffee delivered. Yes, it's. A... Must be a high ranking player. <laughs> so yeah, we do have um, 
I before Okanaran even launched, because of all the issues with shipping, um, I had actually a significant amount of work done toward the next few expansions that we planned for Okanaran. Um, those have all kind of been paused for the moment as we get ready to. Uh, we've had we've had significant issues with the, the health of several employees, not not COVID related actually, but. <laughs> Uh, but thankfully, it's uh, things are improving and looking better. Uh, but we just were not able to move on a lot of stuff the way we wanted to. So everything kind of had to get shifted toward focusing on the materials for uh, the coming Blood of Thunder Kickstarter. So, uh, but we do have there's a lot of design work done on the, on what's coming for Oaken Iron, and we have a plan. We've got three ships sculpted, and we just got to finish another two to three. Uh, depends on what we can actually fit in the mold we plan on making for this. So. Um, that's that so yeah there's there's a lot of stuff coming on top of that we've also got uh the, the campaign that we played online uh that was kind of like a light version and it was a good trial run we we le really learned a lot and got that going so that's going to be that's a future expansion to look at also the, the pdf cards will actually be printed Great. and then um the cool thing that i'm excited about uh and that i don't i don't i don't know if anybody else has really done with the game is um toward the end of the year if you know, obviously, depending on how uh, the world, the state of the world is, <laughs> but toward the end of the year, toward the beginning of next year, we're like we're going to we plan on putting out a um, a boxed a boxed um, kind of uh, yearly update for Oak and Iron, so that'll have all the things that were changed in Errata and stuff like that, awesome. and uh, things that were changed in the cards. So you'll have some cards, a new printed rule book, and uh, a few other little extra goodies in there to help uh, you know incentivize it. Uh, so that way you don't have to just, it's not just, it's a, even though it's a living room book, it's not just in the PDF sense. We want to really print it all and keep so that your cards and stuff are stay up to date as necessary. And of course, that'll be optional. You don't need it because you can just use the printed stuff and that's okay. But Players love that. Thank you. Some major gaming companies could take note from you there. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do what we can. But let's move on to Blood and Plunder, which is one of my very favorite games and what I really want to hear about. Uh, you guys, sounds like you have lots in the works. Every time I hear something new, I'm impressed how much you guys have <laughs> irons in the fire at once. I uh, know you have the Raised Black coming soon and the Kickstarter is going to be, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> but before that, it sounds like you have another release that some people might not have heard as much about, the Queen Anne's War Right, set. Queen Anne's War. So that the Queen Anne's War is kind of like the, um, it's kind of like the, the, the prologue to to the to the Kickstarter, right? It's kind of going to open the window and let you see what direction we're moving into. So it's going to have uh, it's going to add a lot of unit options that you didn't have previously. And this, some of these things will extend into the 17th century. But uh, anyway, but the point of the expansion, I should say, is basically to move the game's timeline from the 1700s to the 1800s. So Queen or Anne's War, 17th to 18th, you mean? I mean 17th to 18th. Yeah, thank you. The 1700s, uh, the 1600s to the 1800s. That's what I mean to say. Yeah. 1700s. So, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 1600s to 1700s. Got it. It's in my head now. Anyway, so Queen Anne's War, which is the war in Europe, is the first major conflict of the of the 18th century, and it's also the it's also the, the sort of the catalyst for what most people would consider the golden age of piracy. So all the pirates of Nassau and the Bahamas and all that. Um, so the book sets up that conflict. It, it also covers some 17th century stuff as well, right? So like we have things like the Braves, which follow King's, King Philip's War, right? So after King Philip's War, which is a, a war between the Native Americans and the New England area again, and, the, and the British colonists, right? So that's like a war they fight there. And that kind of, from that, that's kind of like a pivotal point where the natives start to adapt really well to, to the European style of warfare. And, and uh, you know, they're, they're become more proficient with musketry. Their muskets are more readily available and stuff like that. So, um, they get rid of slow reload? Yes, we get rid of slow reload on Native American units, <laughs> which I know lots of people are excited about. So um, the book will introduce the, the tail end of the buccaneering era, right? So the, the last buccaneers is one of the factions where you have uh, some choices for some later French and English buccaneers and the choices for that and seeing how they develop and eventually become the pirates of the, well, they'll go to the, uh, they'll become the Red Sea men and the, uh, 
and the uh, you know the pirates of of the South Seas, and then eventually become the the pirates of the of Nassau that everybody's that everybody knows well, like Blackbeard and Charles Vane and Jack Rackham and Bonnie Mary Reed, all them. So again, this is just setting kind of the setting the stage for that. So this should come out just right before the Kickstarter launches. We should the book should come out in PDF. Um, since we haven't been able to play test it in person as much as we would like to for obvious reasons with the state of the world, especially here in South Florida, unfortunately, where it's uh, we've been hit especially hard and it's uh, cases are rampant yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, getting together and gaming and play testing is not the, the smartest thing. So we, um, so as a result of that, I know some people, I know, I know a lot of, I've seen places where people aren't as affected and can get together a little more readily. So this is going to kind of be like a, a beta test. So the book will come out as a PDF form and people have the opportunity to try everything out and, and play it and see what works and what doesn't. And then we will tweak it, adjust it, and then update that PDF obviously for free. And then once we feel like it's in a good place, we'll publish it and print it. So that's the plan with that. So is it going to be a free PDF or a, I assume not. I would, I would want to charge for it, but put that work into it. But. No. Yeah. It'll be, um, It'll be like our other books. We don't have a price yet, actually, but okay. it won't be more. <clears throat> it won't be more than twenty dollars, something like that. Probably less, but I don't want to. I'm not in charge of those things, so <laughs> I don't want to say something and then get yelled at later. So don't hold me to it. But I mean, it's definitely not going to be more than twenty dollars. I can assure you that. So, <laughs> so you released a pretty substantial PDF update or end with new factions okay. early in the game's life too. Will this be similar to that or a little bigger? So you're talking about no piece beyond the line? No, before that, when you introduce the, uh, there's like oh, five right. factions in the okay, core Okay, yeah, book, yeah. And then they... Yeah, so right after we did the first Kickstarter and we introduced the French militia, or the Minisys des Caribes, I can never pronounce it, but yeah. So when we, when we released that unit, uh, they needed a faction because we, the French were a stretch goal in the Kickstarter, but we only brought in the French Buccaneers. So I first thing I wanted to do was round out that faction a little bit. So we basically added some French factions. We added a Spanish and English faction as well. And then there, I believe, and just some basic stuff. It's, it's going to be a lot more than that. It's going to be, uh, it, I, I estimate, you know, the amount that you actually typed. And then when the books actually there are graphic, they always end up being really different, but it should be somewhere around 50, 60 pages. So it's not an insubstantial, an unsubstantial document. There's, there's a lot of changes and new things that are going to come into play here. Uh, as the 18th century starts to change things around. Uh, are you going to include some of the new things we've seen on your website, like the fortifications? Not in this book, unfortunately. Um, we wanted to add those in this book, but casting problems with those, with those actual models uh, has basically made us delay that. Right. Uh, the, the rules are coming along, as you know well, since you are working on them. <laughs> So the rules are coming along quite well for them, but it's just we, we're going to put it into uh, its own thing. So you're gonna, we're going to have a dedicated fortifications, and that's going to have rules for mortars and, and all kinds of cool stuff like that as well. So now, which might be, uh, we might put into a book at some point, but for now it'll just be a, probably a free PDF on that one. Great. So the cover of the Palisade Fort and whatnot. Right. The tower, which we already kind of cover, and then the mm -hmm. Palisade Fort. And things of things of that nature. The Palisade Fort's a little different from the tower since it's modular and you can kind of move it around and change the way it works. So that stone fort, have any of you other moderators here had to fight against the stone fort in Blood and Plunder? <laughs> no, I still gotta paint mine. I need someone <laughs> to commiserate with. That thing is a beast. <laughs> it's really easy to paint, actually. You should be able to paint in like ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I need to paint. <laughs> <laughs> so not so much the stone fort, but we were talking on the last episode of the podcast for Tales of the Sail of possibly doing uh, DeGroff's Raid on Veracruz. So we're going to need like a full-sized uh, stonework fort. We need like a, 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 like a Vauban style fort. Would that be what was there or no? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. basically. Yeah, go. You can make whatever you want, man. Will Follow the rules me, be in that. there though? Would they be included <laughs> along with like the same stuff so, as the Palisade? Based on what's in there now, no. But okay. um, maybe that's something we think about as far as those, because you could play. You this would pre, you would only pretty much be able to play something like that in army scale, and even still, right. those sort of fortifications are going to totally dwarf any kind of 
game you're going to play in Blood and Thunder with the, some extreme exceptions, <laughs> such as you large games. use the stone for it before you want to do anything bigger. Oof. <laughs> well, you know, if you wanted us to play test the fortification rules for you, you could just, you know, you give them to us, and then we can, we, uh, we can try it out. <laughs> See how it goes. Well, I'll tell you what. If Glenn paints his fort, we'll do it. Glenn, I swear. We're, we're some god. <laughs> I will drive I down there, Glenn, and risk the plague. I, just, I, like, I, like, I break into his house at night and just like I'm a, standing, you know. I could have a picture of this thing posted on the the Blood and Plunder in the Caribbean Facebook group by uh, tomorrow night if I really wanted to get behind it. <laughs> you can do it tonight, man. You, you can paint, paint it right now during this yeah. this interview here. <laughs> Doesn't look like you're doing a whole lot right now. Just kind of sitting there. <laughs> Let him enjoy the fact that his his child and his wife are out. He banished them. For this interview, for you. Chickens. He banished them for you, Mike. I appreciate that. <laughs> My own family wouldn't even do that for me. <laughs> it's not so bad when you have a boat to hide in, though. It's true. You know? Yeah, I'm not going to go hide in the sheep shed. That's <laughs> like a downgrade. <laughs> um, going back to Queen Anne's War, um, how many models should we expect to be uh, produced for the set. I know there's quite a few new units. I went, I, thanks for sharing the document with me. I've been enjoying looking at it with you guys. But I counted up the numbers and there's actually more new models nor, and more new factions in this small expansion than there was in the core rule book. So <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah, I try. It's, uh, it's not no piece beyond the line. So <laughs> I oh, couldn't. I, I'm the, you're never gonna see another no piece man. I'll tell you again, unless it's uh, unless it's like a compilation of other works I've already done. Over time. I can't uh, survive another book like that. But as far as actual new models that we're gonna make specifically, as in like in metal, excuse me, that we're gonna be releasing soon, um, probably about three, maybe uh, at least two. So the other Native American units that are in there. Um, you'll get a commander as well. So you're looking at about at minimum nine new models that'll come from this in between the, uh, when we, when this goes, when the book comes out and when the Kickstarter delivers. So that'll kind of be the filler in between so that we can keep some new blood and thumb stuff coming while people are waiting for their stuff in the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, <clears throat> but most of the models in Queen Anne's War will be somewhat functional with the models we exist now in the range. Um, some of them will be have to do kind of a, take kind of a stand in role, right? Like, like the, uh, the, um, the, so the, the soldiers, for example, all the regulars, right. They, so those, the, the Kickstarter is going to have uh, plastic soldier kits that are going to have, that are going to have options for like the grenadiers, excuse me, the grenadiers, the, um, for the grenadiers, the regulars, and they're going to have different weapon options and, and equipment options to do different. So you could use, you can make them more like uh, with uh, match locks and bandoliers and such, or you could do the flint locks and cartridge boxes and all that. So you could represent troops of different kind of in transition, which you get in the Queen Anne's War. We already got the Braves, which are a big part of the native faction and can be included in yeah. some of the other ones. Uh, and then can you share what other models we'll be getting for it? So there's going to be a more, there's basically a more elite version of the Braves and a less elite version of the Braves. And those are the two in-betweens that I can guarantee you will get. So the, right. I, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but the nieces, I think it's nice. Nieces or something? <laughs> the nieces, it's a dangerous a, word. To I think it's a Narragansett term. Could be wrong, but, uh, and then there's the young Braves. So following kind of in suit with the other uh, native groups, the way they have their young warriors. So those are, and those will be, and those will be more focused on archery and such. So, and with any luck, we might get a set of plastic Native Americans in the Kickstarter. So that'll be on the stretch mm -hmm. goal side of things. So, nice. but it is on my, it is on my list of my wish list. So I don't, I mean, at some point we'll have that in the future, but whether or not I get in this Kickstarter is a matter of stretch goals. So. <laughs> So saving money for the stretch schools. Yep, that's a good plan. Um, any ships getting released with this uh, PDF expansion? Is so there no any in there? No new ships. Uh, no new ships for right now. I'm. Um, there's um, again. 
we're a little bit choked on resin right now. So we can't really develop a lot of new stuff in resin for a little while. Um, but we will have the new plastic ship in the Kickstarter. And that's what uh, basically I'm focused. Uh, our ship sculpting is focused on that and oak and iron at the moment. So, uh, but we will have, uh, do have, I have a few other ships that we plan on releasing in resin. It's, but it'll probably be uh, around the, probably around the beginning of next year, best case scenario. So. None of us can really complain until we've painted the ships we have, right? Yes, yeah, so a lot of people need to paint and rig their ships, especially rig their ships. Pretty much almost everybody there, except I'm pretty sure Tyler and yourself, Joe, are the only ones who actually have rigged ships over there. Yeah, I could see oh. you looking at Glenn. Um, somehow you knew the orientation <laughs> of where my video boxes were, and I saw you looking up like the Brady Bunch. Yeah. I was looking at Glenn, yes. Just get my sixth only rig, thing. rig. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know if it's still going, but Model Ship World just ran a sale on blocks and tap goal. <laughs> there you go. And if it's still going, I need to jump in and buy some more uh, dead eyes and whatnot. Can't bring myself to do that. Looks like too painful to. Talk about <laughs> <laughs> we good chance the model the plastic ship kit that we're gonna do in the Kickstarter will have a bunch of those in it in plastic. <laughs> that, that would be that really helpful <laughs> because using them in wood is a pain in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, there's going to be um, the the we're actually just finishing up the rig for it right now, and it's pretty. Uh, it's, since we're doing it in plastic, it's kind of cool. The dowel is a little limiting because you can't the the pieces don't look as realistic. Like if you look at a real ship, all the you know the way things um, kind of get smaller and larger in certain places and are carved up mm -hmm. in certain spots. So we have all that cool stuff in there along with the wood texture and everything else. So I'm excited so for how it's going to come out. So it's going to have plastic masts as well, then. Yes. Oh, it'll have plastic rigging, and another another thing on the stretch goal list is uh, alternate rigs, in so different sprue kits to do different types of rigs. So that's another thing that to look out for. Oh man, not to step on Joe's toes, but what it, could we just get a rundown of what you expect to be in the initial Kickstarter? <laughs> yeah, so the initial Kickstarter, uh, what's going to be in it one hundred percent right now, and based on how things go between. Uh, when we launch it, uh, or when we decide to launch it, which is going to be very, it'll be before the end of the summer, hopefully, or before the fall anyway. At the very latest, probably October, but I don't think it'll get that late. And it'll be the first week of October if it is. Um, but we're looking at, for sure, the two-player starter set. The two-player starter set is going to have, uh, and I'm, we're about to publish a uh, kind of a, an FAQ page on what basic stuff you can definitely expect to be in it. And we're, you know, we're, we're basically gearing up to start doing a lot of previews and, and stuff for the project because it's, it's coming along pretty nicely at this point. So, uh, but we've got the two-player starter set, which has two sloops in it. It's going to have two small crews of about 13 models each, including their commanders. And the commanders are, are Maynard and Blackbeard. And obviously, I know I've talked about this lots of times, but the, the, it's themed around Blackbeard's last battle, right, where he gets, uh, whereas, like, if you were in the, conversation yesterday where he basically gets slaughtered by Maynard <laughs> <laughs> and um, and that's going to have you know it's going to have the oak and iron treatment uh, so if you have the oak and iron box very similar to that but, but geared toward blood and plunder and uh, a little bit more assembly required obviously because uh, this will be hard plastic not the PVC that we have for oak and iron so <clears throat> it'll have the, the sprues of sailors which will all be customizable you can have options for muskets pistols brace of pistols blunder buses explosives boarding pikes things like that um, you'll have um, the ship you'll have the artillery um, all the rigging and such as usual the elastic rigging will stay the same uh, you'll have a rule book in there it's looking like we're going to do either a soft cover or a mini soft cover we're looking at options on that just to see what works best um, and a paper mat it'll be the full rule book though i should say i should point that out uh, we're a paper mat, uh, some some punchboard terrain, punchboard rulers and tokens. So instead of the marker dice, you'll have uh, cardboard tokens for all, all the stuff and uh, turning gauges and all that stuff. So, you know, everything you need to play Blood and Thunder with ships and everything, right? Awesome. Ready to go right out of the box. So, uh, that's the that's the main event of the whole Kickstarter. And uh, I don't know if I'm I don't I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this, but I think we're shooting for uh, for about a hundred bucks as buy-in, uh, just for the box. So obviously, as you know, I, as we always do, 
there'll be uh, some different options and levels. And another thing is going to be at least 10 new commanders. Um, so there'll be the, there's going to be a whole bunch of new captains. Now these are pretty much all pirates exclusively, right? Wow. <laughs> um, so this, this Kickstarter is a little bit more pirate themed than, than ever before. Right. So, uh, even though there's lots of new characters that you're going to get in no piece beyond the line and whatnot, those will be coming out in metal. Whereas these characters will all be in plastic. Um, exactly how I'm pretty sure they're going to be individual right now. We have talked about just doing a box of all the characters, but I think we're going to do individual characters so people can pick and choose the ones they want. They don't have to commit to the whole thing. Um, but then, uh, so then we've got the, the sailor box, which will have the, it'll come with 12 sailors and each sailor is going to have, it's, you know, it's in sprues. So each, each sprue is going to have uh, six bodies on it, along with tons of options for heads and, weapons and accessories and all kinds of stuff so you're going to be able to customize customize them like crazy uh it'll come with plastic bases in the box too like the deck planking like we've done before uh of course we're going to continue to sell the metal bases which to me is the ideal thing the metal bases we might throw into the kickstarter as an option because i just i really like being able to offer that to people because having a, a plastic bottle and a metal base is great especially on a ship keeps them weighed down and and where they need to stay where they need to be um, so the other sprue kit, the one that's presently in the works right now, we've got the base bodies done and now we're adding accessories, is the soldiers. So that one's going to be, um, you know, just like, your, just like the, sold, the European soldiers we have now, but these will be a little more customizable and they'll have the options for the 18th century, uh, different uh, shoulder ribbons and little details to differentiate them between certain factions and whatnot, different hat choices and head choices and, and weapons and whatnot, so. Uh, those are the things that are going to be in there 100 percent for sure there's so, a go ahead tyler uh, i was going to say um one of the people here in the chat is asking um so his name is jacob and he is asking if we've got any of the plastic figures that we could show off as previews for the kickstarter campaign uh you guys I have are... them to where i can share screen if that's okay with you go for it Okay, so let me share screen here. See. The other thing I'll ask Mike while Tyler's setting that up is the second question that, that Jacob asks is, are these plastics scaled exactly the same way as the metal miniatures? And I assumed yes. the answer was, was yes. Yes, yes, definitely. They'll be matching uh, up with the uh, rest of our range, just, just the same. So I believe this is one of the sailor sprues? Yeah, so these are, so these are the models on the sailor sprues. So you'll notice some of the, don't pay too much attention to the way some of them are like cut and spread because we haven't, that, that's part of what's in process right now is making sure all the pieces fit the way they're supposed to together. So the sculpting is done. It's just a matter of uh, getting everything to fit together in the engineering aspect of it now. And then the other one that I have up is one of the soldiers. Oh, yeah. This pose is actually probably going to change, but yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I pulled the one he where he's the, at like the one. <laughs> the modern low carry kind of. Yeah, but you will see it's a it is a good example of uh, of what's coming. So, all right, and I will stop sharing unless anyone would like me to pull anything else up. That's more a question for Mike. I'm not the peanut gallery is obviously going to want to see lots more. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a whole lot more to show right now, unfortunately. Uh, the one thing I'd love that I really want to show, but we're saving it, is the, is the ship. The ship is coming out really cool. And it's going to be, to differentiate it from the existing sloop, it's going to be a, um, this is going to be a Bermuda sloop. So, slightly different. It's actually smaller, but will carry more guns uh, as, is, as, the, as the time frame progresses, ships are able to, to do that as guns get uh, lighter and, and uh, and uh, as casting techniques get better and ships are able to carry more is the big thing. Uh, but uh, so it's going to carry a little more guns. It's basically, it's roughly the size of the bark. And um, I, I really like the styling of it. So I'm looking forward to that one. So the Kickstarter is going to include plastic sailors, customizable, mm -hmm. plastic soldiers, which are also customizable. And a couple of sloops, and then a bunch of characters, a bunch of 
Are these all commanders or other they're all characters? Command. Well, the they're, they're characters or commanders. Like we have Anne, Bonnie, and Mary Reed, who are not commanders, but they are characters that you can use. Mm -hmm. And obviously, they'll have some synergy with Jack Rackham and such. Um, and Jack Rackham will be available as a captain or as quartermaster to Vane. And you can do things like that. So um, anytime, so there's, there'll be a few options where they can switch. Um, but uh, I should mention too that the ships will be available on their own as well, in their own kits. And the different rigging options will be if, that will stretch goal will, will, will kind of, will probably end up being parts of those kits. So you'll just have like a small ship kit. And then there's, um, we've already set it up so that if we get that, which I hope we do, if we're able to hit that part of the stretch goals, then we, um, then we can add more sprues into the box so that you have more rigging options within the box. So does it kind of be centered around that one customizable small ship right. for the ship options? Yeah. And uh, one, no of the, one, of the, one of the stretch goals that we may, <laughs> that we, that we may not get to just because it'll be so high because doing a ship is incredibly expensive. Let me tell you. That's the reason there's, compared to previous Kickstarters where we've had tons and tons of models and stuff, I mean, the, a vast majority of what's going into this project is making that ship. That is not, that is, it's, it's a series of, it's a series of molds and it's a very expensive mold. <laughs> so, but we've gone with a company who's doing, um, we, we've not gone, we could do it cheaper with other people, but we've gone with the better company that we've seen their work. We've, we've looked, it took us a long time to find the right partner to do the hard plastics with. Uh, we've been looking for about three years, really. And uh -huh we finally settled on one that we're really happy with. So um, we are, again, so anyway, I, I segued there a little bit, but the point being that the ship is a, just a terribly expensive model to make, but on the higher end of the stretch goals will be, if we could get there, a, uh, a three section ship. So it'll be a, like a, a medium ship if you want, yeah, kit. It'll probably end up just being one rig up at first, uh, but it'll be, since it's, since the nature of those ships, the rigs aren't as flexible, you tend to just with more square sails for the most part, right? Yeah. It'll, um, you'll be able to make a few different things out of it just with whole parts, right? So just to kind of, uh, to make it, so the, the ships are gonna be pretty customizable too. So different like head rails and different options, and little decorations and things like that, so. And so you mentioned Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to ask um, the little ships that you're talking about, like the Bermuda Sloop style. How many decks are we looking at for that? Since the uh, the the additional structure will be three. Two. It'll be a two deck ship, just like all the uh, the sloop and the Tartana and the uh, bark and all that. So it's cool. a two section ship. Yeah. So you are getting mostly pirates for this. You mentioned the possibility of plastic natives as well yeah so here's some of the other plastics that we'd like to do so there's three other plastic kits that are on the uh, on the agenda that we have no sculpting or anything started for so these we just can't uh, we just can't right now <laughs> they just live too much limited uh, bandwidth on our end I'm afraid but uh, we do have concepts for them and we do know exactly how we want to execute on all of them so uh, stretch calling it it'll turn around pretty quick so the first one is the first one up would is going to be militia. So it's a sprue with militia, and that one is going to be interchangeable in a lot of respects with the sailor sprue. So the sailor sprue and the militia sprue will be able to share a lot of parts. Uh, then we'll also have a um, then we'll have a cavalry sprue, which everybody I know is very excited about because we can you'll have the option to have uh, lancero cavalry and different other lots of other choices and. You don't have to have that giant chunk of metal. <laughs> for a Those are so horse. cool, but they're so expensive. And <laughs> yeah, heavy yeah. Too. so it'll be, um, so yeah, that'll be great. And then that's going to set up for an expansion I'd like to do in the future, which is the Pueblo Revolt. So anything on so basically the Southwest. So Cowboys and Indians before Cowboys and Indians, right? 17th century version of that, which has the Cuera Cavalry for the Spanish, which are the, if you've ever seen pictures of them, get this fan back, it's very hard. Um, it's the guys with the big shield, right? The big Spanish style shield and they have lenses and they've got like the hat with the tassels and everything. And those are going to be like so that. cool. <laughs> they're, they're really cool looking. So uh, I want to have the options to do all that stuff in there. So I don't know how we're going to do tassels on the plastic. It's going to be hard to figure out, but 
Just <laughs> have real cloth ones. Glue yeah, them there you go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if GW can figure out purity seals, I'm sure you can figure out some tassels. <laughs> well, GW has that entire like division of engineers, so I don't have access to that's that. fair. <laughs> they, just, they just have like a tassel guy that they keep in the basement, you know. Tassel guy, right? I think that's Some, a somewhere different in thing, Yeah, that's a that's a different thing, Tom. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I am turning into Mitch. Yeah, <laughs> little by little. Oh little. no. <laughs> so. There's a bunch of op- possibilities, but the whole Kickstarter will be centered on the pirate options, which is cool because right now, Blood and Plunder is a pirate game, but it's not really a pirate game. It's more of a yeah. We're going full pirate empires. on this Kickstarter. Yeah, this is full pirate on this one. I, well, I am lying. There is one non-pirate character, and that's Maynard. So he's a pirate hunter and the, and a, an actual legitimate pirate killer. So he's a uh, he he's basically the the embodiment of me in the game. For the for the Kickstarter, so. <laughs> because according to my partners, I hate pirates. <laughs> They're very happy that they could finally fully market all out pirates for once. They're very excited about that. <laughs> Anything else you want to say about the where is the black Kickstarter? You guys in the room here have any questions? So I have a question. So you. Um... You've, you've been super focused on the logistics of this, and I'm sure it's overwhelming. Um, but yes. as competitive gamers, well, three out of the four of us, I suppose, are, are competitive. So I wouldn't include myself in that since I'm terrible. Um, cause they're, they're all wearing the shirts. If, the, if you guys want to stand up real quick. Attempted, attempted guys, competitive. They coordinated. Um, and I don't have one yet, but I got <laughs> I gotta bug the quartermaster guy and see if I can. I'm serious. Tell you I'm sure. So um, you haven't had a chance to do a lot of playtesting. But using your brilliant gamer's brain, how do you expect these new characters will play? Like, how do you expect the new um, factions your design will play? Perfectly. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Otherwise you change them, right? (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So um, there's a lot of new stuff. So the the one that's the most different, if if that's a correct term, out of all of them, is the is the new um, is the new regular military units right? Uh, so those are going to play a lot different than anything you've seen so far. It'll be it'll be the equivalent of like when we added Nace in the in the last expansion, where they just have a completely different playstyle. So these guys are all about coordination and big sweeping maneuvers that all in right. So they rely really heavily on command points. They're all about leadership. And the, basically, they're almost like the, the command is almost like a puppeteer and they're just they're marionettes, right? So, um, but they do have the ability to lay out some tremendously powerful volleys and, and stuff like that. And just the, it's going to be pretty different to play those types of forces. Um, but I think it'll be interesting. I think it's going to appeal to a lot of people, especially those who kind of like the, 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 the black powder period, you know, stand in formation and fire sort of tactics and even if you don't play them that way because they do you can play them as light infantry just as well they're still very coordinated and very organized and, and they do really well so they're going to be they're going to be the um the potential thing that I, I have to watch to make sure that doesn't get too over the top um there uh, there were some uh, there, there's the new native factions which are going to be kind of interesting too because it's they're kind of an evolution of that faction and they are they're less restrained by their by their weaponry now, so it's not going to be the storm of arrows. The arrows are going to be more used in support now, probably with this faction. Um, and then the, the the core of it is going to be musketry and melee attacks, right? And they've got some. So one of the native abilities is they can they can um, if you shoot at them, they can go prone immediately, and then they get the first time they get a bonus. They get a save bonus of one, but then they're prone. So the rest of the time you're shooting at them, if you're trying to give them coordinated fire, they're going to continue to be prone. Um, so, okay. and, and that's, yeah. So they're going to be harder to hit. So if you're not aware of what, I know very people, a lot of people use prone that much, but it's very, it's especially useful on ships. If you haven't been using it, I recommend trying it. <laughs> especially when you need have guys with no guns and grenades or something like that. But, um, but yeah, so the, that faction is going to be, should be interesting to see how it actually plays out. I haven't actually seen that one play at all yet, unfortunately. So 
uh, I'm really excited what happened to it. Um, another so these one army is, factions are actually part of the Queen Anne's War, right? Correct, Queen Anne's War, yeah. So you should, so you should, should see them pretty soon. Very soon, yeah. Um, so we've got the another cool one. There's some, the, the later, the, the last Buccaneers faction, which has, um, so you have some later, later freebooters, which don't have the same kind of, they're not at the same martial level as the previous Buccaneers, right? So these are, these guys are like 1690s, late 1690s, early 1700s Buccaneers, right? This is the very last kind of wave of Buccaneers that exists. And they're already becoming more like pirates. In fact, I think we, I think their, their unit name, if I remember correctly, is Jamaica Privateers, Jamaican Privateers, which is what they were, they, they weren't even called Buccaneers anymore, that's what they were called. They are called Jamaican Privateers. So, um, but they're, they're basically replacing the freebooter, your existing freebooter models are, are, will be perfectly fine to use these. In fact, I believe that's the model we're gonna use in the book. Um, but also in the upcoming plastic kits, so the sailors that are in those kits and the double, especially if you mix it with the militia sprues that will hopefully come out as well, then uh, you will have the option because of all the options in the, in the sprues, you'll have the option of fitting those sailors out as buccaneers. So you could actually use them as 17th century buccaneers or, or even 18th century buccaneers or pirates or sailors or whatever you want to do. So, but anyway, so um, they're kind of cheaper buccaneers. They're kind of cheaper freebooters, these guys, but they're not as uh, but they're still armed well. They still got some. They still got some cool options. And then you've got the later filibusters, which are another choice. Which they kind of, again, they 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 don't lose quite as much as the English do, but they're still not of the same ilk as their as the guys before. So it makes so, the Buccaneers a little different. They're now a little cheaper. You could take a lot more models in in your army, uh, but they're not quite as effective as they have been in the past. Um, another one I know Joe's excited about is. Um, so in Queen Anne's War, uh, the whole point of the war is the is the is the Spanish is the uh, essentially the Spanish throne going to the the French basically right. So as a result, the Spanish and the French are on the same side in this war. So one of the things you get is you get Spanish and French troops and not just troops but irregulars as well, like Buccaneers, for example, um, operating together in a lot of in a lot of uh, campaigns. So for example you can take you're going to be able to take milicianos alongside uh, uh bucaneers for example or filibusters or later filibusters and things like that so uh that's going to be a pretty cool army it's a very very mix of french and spanish a lot of cool choices there and i think if i remember right some native options as well um so those are those are kind of some of the standout ones we've also got some there's some other ones in there like the uh the ones that cover the actual real the the french and indian wars part of it which right which is the north american conflicts is gonna have they're gonna have so you're gonna have stuff like raiders raider factions which are basically um it's basically european factions that are made up of primarily native american troops right so you basically have like uh like some kind of emissary to the native american groups that is uh, along with a small contingent of his own forces and then you know tons of native americans attacking another faction so like the the english attacking raiding the the spanish uh, missions down in Florida and Georgia, or the uh, the French attacking the English, or the British attacking the French along with the Iroquois and stuff like that. So that's all going to be, you're going to have a lot of choices like that. So there's a lot of faction mixing that happens in, in this one, which is going to be a lot of fun. But I think that's mostly, those are most of the big ones, I think. There's a few other ones, but those are the standouts that I think people can expect to see how they, that, that'll play a little different from what we've typically seen. So we're forward to playing those radio, radio factions, they look fun. Yeah, I want to do that. Uh, so we have a couple of audience questions that I'll, I'll toss to you, Mike. Um, sure. So uh, Kevin Wallace is asking, are the new units going to be balanced so they're playable against lists from the current books? Or do you think that there might eventually be a need to balance the forces by different time periods and say, you know, these are self-contained, these are self-contained. So th mm -hmm. these are balanced with the current lists. So the plan is to do a steady power creep and then increase the cost of the actual boxes as they go. And uh, that's that's a joke. I see your face like. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, no. There. So I actually thought about that a lot uh, because so I did think about splitting it up and changing it. Um, and what we've decided to do is not is to is to basically make it all playable against each other. So if we eventually get to the uh, you know the seminal wars, right, something really late, uh, that will still be playable against seventeenth century stuff if you want to. 
Um, and then what we'll do is for certain time periods, we'll recommend point levels. So obviously some later stuff will be more expensive than, late, than earlier stuff in order to balance it correctly. Um, but for this portion of it, it's really not the case so much. I mean, there, there is some small price jumps here and there, like, like the faction, the rate, a faction of all regulars and grenadiers, for example, is going to be pretty expensive, but, uh, not so much so that it won't be competitive with the older stuff. Um, but, but we use a points formula to figure out all of our points and it's held up pretty well so far, I think. So we're just going to continue to use that. And, um, the only thing that might, that obviously could throw a wrench into that is special rules. And as of this moment, I don't think we've added any special rules. I mean, we've got plenty already, so we got plenty to work with. And there's some faction rules and stuff, but that that's um, you know, that's that just takes uh, some play testing. But so far, I think everything feels pretty good. And um, oh, go ahead, Tyler. I was gonna say, I think that segues into Sean Martin's question, um, which is how the expansions know. will work with running tournaments. I'm not going to answer any of Sean Martin's questions. He just, uh, I should have just said spoke. Sean. Uh, <laughs> spoke. I didn't like what he said in the chat earlier. So. <laughs> we'll just call him S. Martin. <laughs> yeah, so um, he's saying, so obviously you said that we'll be able to use forces against one another. Uh, so I guess the real question would be for tournaments, are you guys ever going to specify one period or another? Like, this is a 250-point land tournament. Please use the stuff from the later... Tournaments. I, I you seem very see, optimistic I, about the state of the world. Yeah, I, I can see you know, I can see us doing that, but I don't I don't know how often we're going to get to test it out, right? <laughs> yeah. um, That's assuming we're ever able to be in the same room together ever again. And if we are, <laughs> then the plan is to uh, yeah the, the the plan. So what we're going to update the uh, the tournament manual, and what we're going to do is basically do um, we are going to break it down into time periods, right? And there's going to be a formal system for all that. And for tournaments, you basically are going to have the, the organizer of the tournament is going to have the option of doing a set time period. So you can say, oh, you know, I want, I want just, just for the sake of theme or whatever, right? Um, mm -hmm. We're going to do, we, we may even add regions to this. We have, we've, we've been talking about that. That just might be a cool thing to add on there if you want your tournament to be themed around something, right? Um, and just for the just for the fun of it, obviously, just try something different. Kind of like uh, there's a there's some local DBA guys who always have themes to all their different. They have like well, at their cons, they have like five. They run five different tournaments all weekend, and each one will be a different theme. There'll be one where it's like all you have to have like all horses or something like that. You know, just all kinds of stuff just to switch it up and play something different, right? But so that's the idea. So the idea will be that you're going to be able to define, you could just say it's an open tournament, in which case you just bring anything you want from any time period, any region, whatever. Or you could say it's a, you know, this is a, this is a late 17th century tournament. So it'll be 1650 to 1700 cutoff. Cause all the, and we've been kind of working towards that. If you look at from no peace beyond the line, all of the factions have dates on them. So uh, those dates will be what, uh, what determines whether or not something's legal for your event. And that's just up to the organizers themselves. So they so should like, be balanced, but you can, organizers can tweak it. Yeah, out. Sorry. yeah. Just, just in case you want to do a theme. So if you want to do like a, let's say you want to do a, let's say, so factions only operating in Hispaniola, right? So you're going to bring French and Spanish and Native Americans, right? in the in the early 1800s let's say you know that's what you want to do for a theme for your tournament then you know cool that stuff's going to be in there and you're going to have the tools to be able to do that if you want to that will also be really useful for people doing the like the pickup game scenario design and things like that right. like bring your own force and we'll play this hey, hey mike i i do have a question and it's kind of what we talked about a few fridays ago you know as we go forward and you're introducing these new lists as history moves you know, into the future, warfare changed a lot too. And the beauty yeah. of the of the rule set really is the, how you do skirmish warfare. As we get into more linear types of warfare, how are you looking at tweaking the rules to uh, to allow you know a smooth transition from skirmish gaming to more or skirmish tactics to more linear? So, you know, ironically. <laughs> In our theater, what actually happens is sort of the opposite. People are, even though even though all the stuff we cover in the game is not very linear, it's all very skirmishy. But realistically, you know, Europeans came to the New World and they fought in a linear fashion. 
and then as they encouraged that as they encountered uh native american guerrilla warfare right so that's, that's part of the reason the spanish were so successful right because they had already been accustomed to that kind of warfare in the reconquista fighting against the moors in spain so they were kind of already familiar with that to a small degree not the same exact type of guerrilla warfare but it's you know similar um so the the tactics that develop in the new world and in general going forward uh tend to focus a lot more on the native american style of warfare and integrating that into the linear style of european warfare so we so like i said so the the european regular units that we're bringing in they fight in that very linear fashion so they're the one faction that's really going to go in that direction uh there's going to be some choices for other things like militia and provincials that will also go in that direction but more or less it's going to be the evolution so like one of the things that starts to in this period and really in the late 17th century you start to see the development of ranger units right and that's really the that for for this size of battles that we play in blood and plunder that's the dominant fighting style that's what's successful more or less right uh and typically when you mix that with some kind of uh, linear european sort of tactic is when you get the most success so if like in um in uh, i can't remember the name of the the first big battle of the last French and Indian War, where they, yeah. uh, you know, they used a combination of linear tactics to basically create a wall, and then, and then use skirmishers on the flanks to just envelop and shoot them to pieces. Yeah, I remember we talked about that, so it was a setup question. But uh, thanks <laughs> a lot. Thank you very much. No problem. So let me ask you a question, kind of related to that, like scaling up thing, because you're mentioning that. The warfare of the period still fits pretty well to the game mechanics, um, right. and it makes complete sense to me. Uh, but you guys must have play tested like the big army size battles, right? And I haven't yeah. had the privilege of yet playing in, you know, one of Tyler Stone's. You know, I painted for four years. Um, you know, pirate canoe battles. Um, <laughs> painted and, for four days and yeah, didn't yeah. sleep. <laughs> just didn't stop just staring at the models, you know, and talking to them. <laughs> Um, so like, what's the biggest battle you guys ever play tested? The biggest like, how, battle, how do the rules scale up for something that size? Yeah, so they scale up pretty well. The biggest battle we ever did was, um, I don't, I'm not even sure I remember the points, but I know that we had about, we had, we had close to 300 models on the table. It was a land battle. And we, and we played it on a six by four. And we set up, we actually set up like, several small towns it's like two on each end and then one on another end and roads connecting them some forests and hills in between just to try to do kind of like more mobile warfare right like larger scale stuff and that was the biggest we tried and that i mean we finished it up in i think we finished that in about four hours uh, and this was early in the game's development this is when we first started trying out the army rule so we just started right at the top and just went crazy like because we were actually going to play it in with the standard rules and that's where the kind of the idea for the army rules came say well we can just kind of get units and uh and, and just basically get whole armies and turn them into units essentially right and then that's, so that's what we did because basically units were uh when we scaled it up i think units were like minimum size of like of like 16 or 20 and the maximum of like <laughs> so, something crazy i don't remember what it was but so I did, we're like at this point like you just need so much of the same thing it just almost doesn't make sense you know <laughs> so um that's where the idea so again that's where the idea for the thing came from and then uh but they, we so we played that way it worked pretty well it was an early version but it was uh that it's, it's close to 300 models i would say yeah something like that because i remember just on my side i had like 140 something uh, and i was playing spanish and i had like 140 something and i think the we were playing in buccaneers and i think they had like 120 or so something like that so I'm not sure those numbers are 100% right, but that is <laughs> that is crazy. That's twice the size of the entire game that I put on at Fall End. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've put some pretty big ones on. Uh, typically, we typically do around uh, 150 to 200 models in a lot of the convention games we run. Uh, it just depends. But yeah, and those, those usually run pretty well. We usually have, again, it takes about the same amount of time, three, four hours, typically sometimes less. Uh, and that's including setup and everything. And that's with you know, six to 10 players. Good. So mm -hmm. I, I actually, I'm actually really happy with the way it scales. I'm, 
and now a lot of people have the models. Hopefully, with plastic models, this will be a thing we can pe more people can try because you'll have a lot more. You know, you have a lot more uh, access to more affordable models. So uh, much real life plastics be compared to the metals. Metals run three bucks each, basically. Yeah, I don't know yet. I can't actually give you a price, but it's it's going to cost less than the metals. I can tell you that. Uh, not a, it's not going to be like a ton. It's not like, it's not like ten cents a bottle or anything like that. But it's. Uh, <laughs> I think it'll be more along the lines of about a buck. I want to say, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but yeah, something close to that anyway. Are we going to be, do you know how many are going to be in a pack? Like right now metals, I know are in four per pack, but are we going to look at like 12, be, 24? As, as of right now, it's doing like 12. So seems yeah, so like I a think, good spot. <laughs> yeah, I think I want to say those are going to be like 20 or so. So maybe a little bit more than, I guess it'd be more like $1.50 or something. I don't, I don't know. Just, don't, don't ask me to do math. It's okay. <laughs> That's why I'm not allowed to mess with these things. I just, I just make the rules. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a couple of uh, army scale games up to a thousand points, and yeah, I really enjoy how it works. Although yeah, it's, it's, it's it's an interesting dynamic when you have. Uh, it really plays the same. Your units are just a, a lot more flexible because they have a lot more options within the unit itself. Because since the units are so much bigger and have different troop types in them, typically, they don't have to, but they can't. Played a thousand point galleon battle and man <laughs> did not go how i expected it was <laughs> remarkable how much damage a heavy a broadside of heavy cannons can do oh yeah we we, <laughs> we did a game at uh we did a game at adepticon and i believe we had like 12 or 14 players and everybody had a ship <laughs> and there was two galleons at the end of the lines fighting each other and they <laughs> I think you. I think the same thing happened to you. I think one somebody pulled that they uh, shoal, and they, this, that did that happen to you too? Oh yeah, every time. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, for this game, it. Yeah, I don't think it did the thousand point galleon list. I just no. chose to wait till I was closer, and it was a bad choice. I got hit first by a strict commander, <laughs> and just my ship melted. It was insane. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, the wow. So the the one galleon got hit a shoal like immediately. <laughs> on the card draw and then the other one just turned around behind it and raked it at oh. super close range and i think so it was just it was just incredible and then i think he rolled something like 68 dice <laughs> and then same thing like that just like an unheard of number in blood and thunder <laughs> you know that's like that's like uh it's like kings of war numbers it was just insane <laughs> But, but there's yeah. a lot of fun to be had at those big point levels. Oh yeah, especially when you give everybody a ship. That's the that's the it's it's gonna. It's, it, <laughs> I've never seen that not go south. <laughs> <Convention game. laughs> give everybody a ship. Tyler, no Tyler's been to to one. Of, it never doesn't go like. There's always some guy that's just like, you're looking at him like, what are you doing? Man? <laughs> yeah, it, it just instantly goes sideways. <laughs> People do it. Ironic. Silly things with their ships, or what? What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, I ran a club just, game with four people, and that happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. The first time I played with the galleon, I played the galleon against. It wasn't an army scale, but I played a galleon against two other people. And the first thing somebody did, of course, is turn and just sail straight toward me. That didn't go too well for them. So, rake, right? <laughs> so rake, immediately gave me a rake, like in the first turn of the game. <laughs> and I, of course, destroyed the ship immediately. And um, <laughs> the first turn, the, the ship was sunk on the third turn. So it was underwater, third turn. So it was done. Oh, wow. <laughs> and th thankfully he had a longboat, and he actually was able to board me, but it was too late. It was a <laughs> longboat to board a galleon. Yeah, right. <laughs> that no, happened was, in the game that I played ship. with Mike. <laughs> yeah, well, that was, a, that was a bark, actually. But close enough, you might as well be a longboat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's basically a longboat. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was a brave bark. They, the bark came up behind the galleon, boarded from the stern, Jumped up into the gallery, started throwing grenades up top, <laughs> and up killed the admiral. And was looking like they were going to start taking it, and then the Spanish counterattack just wiped them out. But it was a valiant effort. They tried. Was I have some uh, nerdy questions about subsections for you sometime later. I have somebody in my group planning to make a turtle galleon list where everybody's under the deck. But they can still do their sailing actions and everything. I think he's trying to break the system. So heads up. <laughs> that's fine. That that whole thing was kind of like a mess, to be honest with you. That that'll be something that we clear that we clean up at some point. 
Some sections are kind <laughs> so, of complicated, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> yes, they are. It was, it's, yeah. I mean, it, it was fine for what it was at the time. We didn't really have any other solutions. But now that we've played them a bit, I, I definitely have better solutions. <laughs> Good to hear. <laughs> but yeah. It does get do it before he tries to kill me with this galleon. <laughs> <laughs> So what's um, next? I think we touched on some of these already, but I wanted to ask you about your fire starters. You've done a couple over the last, what, eight, 10 months? You get the yeah. pikemen, you do. So we've done two, basically, is what we've done. Two sets. There's two sets, yeah. The first one was one unit, just the pikemen, it's kind of a trial run. The second one was the uh, the three new units that we've gotten out, yeah. Cour de Bois, militia, Canadian well, militia. The Cour de Bois was actually just a release. So the Cour de oh, Bois yeah. was what triggered it because, you know, the Cour de Bois on their own were kind of a weird thing to release. So, well, let me release. We could do a fire starter around this too and then to release the other stuff along with it. And that was the plan. That's what we did. And uh, even even amidst the madness that was the coronavirus, it still kind of went okay. I think, I think it went pretty well. Cour de Bois, also known as the Bearded Buccaneers. Yes. <laughs> That's a good name for them, yeah. <laughs> Do you have any pl um, plans for more of those in the future, or are you going to kind of focus on your other two big releases? So probably. Um, most of the other units that we have planned will probably be released that way. Okay. Uh, just depends. I mean, a, really a lot of things just really depend on how this Kickstarter goes, right? Like, mm -hmm. are we just barely fund? This is going to be by far the most expensive project we've ever done, right? So it's, it's just tapping our – it's going to tap our resources in a major, major way. So don't expect to see, like, don't be shocked when you see a gigantic <laughs> funding goal on there, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, because it's, you know, it's expensive. And it's, I mean, it's going to be uh, over, it's going to be well over 100000 before we even start to make money on this project. Uh, because just, I mean, just the molds alone right now, just for the basic molds that we have right now, uh, I want to say it's like, uh, what, let me see. About a hundred grand <laughs> just on the most. <laughs> so more or less, you know, just a just throwing a number out there. But that's pretty close. Uh, it might even be more than that. I don't even know. Because I think yeah, the, the base mold that we have to pay for, I think it puts it over a little bit. But yeah, it's so it's a lot. It's a big investment. But we really believe in the game. We believe in the brand and we think that um, it metal and resin is we we enjoy doing metal and resin. It's cool to have control and to be able to do everything in house and have that. But as the game has grown and as the community has grown, um, the only thing that really scales with that is plastic, you know, and then it's, it's just really hard to turn things around in the way we need to with the metal and the resin and then metal price fluctuates and it just, mm -hmm. it gets, uh, it gets complicated. So uh, for the success that we've really been blessed to have, we, I think it needs to, that's the, the natural progression. That doesn't mean we'll get rid of the metals. Of course, that'll stay on, but the primary focus will be moving on to the plastics and doing those types of things. And you'll still continue to see new metal products going forward, like the ones we just talked about. Those obviously all be in metal, um, but uh, but we really want to start moving more toward the plastics going forward. So we can accept expect some fire starters, but nothing set in stone yet. Yeah, there will be almost for sure. I mean, and if the Kickstarter goes great, so yeah, I, I tangented there, but but if the Kickstarter goes great, and we you know crush our funding goals, and we hit stretch goals, and we're able to add stuff and. And we've got the and we've got the capital to just execute on a bunch of new units without having to go through the uh, fire starter process. Then great, we'll do that. And it's always easier to do it that way than than have to you know basically ask really them to front and then get it done right. Yeah. So fire starters is kind of just a our way my or my way of trying to create more consistent new releases outside of Kickstarters um, while still doing it the same way that we've that basically works for us right. Um, but hopefully, again, as things grow, then we can move beyond that and and not have to. Hopefully, we don't have to do them anymore. It's a better way to put it, right? So we get the releases without having to do the fire starter. It's just like, hey, here it is. It's pre-order. It, it's, yeah. it's coming. You know, that's always the preferred way to do it if it's possible. I was going to ask you, what, like, what what lessons you took from like the first Kickstarters you did? Like, what things are you doing differently this time around? Um, things that you kind of learned. You're like, did, did you learn to like set your goal higher because you expect to hit it? Um, did you kind of like, have you expanded the scope of what you tend to cover? You know, how have yeah. you changed your approach? So that's a, that's some pretty much all the things you've said for the most part. I think it's getting dark. Let me turn my light on. Um, yeah. So like the biggest one is like the, like I just talked about the funding goal, right? So 
uh, our funding goals at, I mean, thankfully we've always crushed our funding goals and gone way beyond them. So that's, it's been okay. <laughs> but uh, looking back at our funding goals, they've never been realistic. Uh, we thought they were, we were looking at like the cost of the molds and the basic things, but that overlooked a lot of, of the unknown that basically crops up into every project so far. I've never had a project that didn't just have just a ton of obstacles thrown at me that were just completely unexpected and unknown, you know, at the time. So that's just the way it goes. Right. But, uh, so with that in mind, um, yeah, you need to have, <laughs> so like, like all your, in the future, all of our projects will definitely have a more carefully thought out funding goal <laughs> so that, because the biggest problem, right. in a Kickstarter is your stretch goals. So, we're hitting stretch goals and we still really haven't actually paid for what we need to pay for on the back end of, of the mold making and the casting and the, you know, the sculpting and the, the printing and everything else that goes with it. Right. So that's definitely something that is uh, that we've talked about and that you'll see. Um, at least you'll probably see, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe they'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll not do that, <laughs> but I, I don't get to make these decisions, like I said before, but that's what I, uh, that's what we've all been talking about. It will probably be the case, uh, you know, cause a lot of, a lot of Kickstarters will not put their actual, what they actually need to make the project. They don't want to scare people. Right. Which is understandable. You know, it's marketing at the end of the day, but it's uh, you know, as long as you're actually able to, you got to put the funding goal. We've always put the funding goal somewhere where at least we know we could deliver the project, even if it didn't do what we wanted it to. Right. So that we don't leave everybody hanging. That's the most important thing. We don't ever, I don't like, I would, I would never allow us to be one of those Kickstarters that just leaves people hanging. Even if it, even if it was a failure, if it funded and people gave us money, you've got to get it all right. That's just the, you know, the right thing to do. Right. So, but, um, but a lot of other things, uh, really the first time, if I would have known everything I knew now, everything I know now, if I would have known it then when we did our first two Kickstarters. And I would, I would have absolutely done them in plastic. I would have, I would have been moving in this direction from then. Now at the time, really, we didn't know the, we, we had explored that option, but we just didn't have the right connections and the right resources to make it happen. But I would have taken the time to, to focus on that, right? The future me could talk to Pasvi and say, Hey, make that happen because that's really the way to go. It's just from a, from a growth perspective, you know, it's, you, it's just really hard to do anything that's just metal, you know, and resin is another option that's becoming popular now, but it's something I'd like to avoid if I can, just because I don't like working with it that much. It's got, you know, it's a, it's, it's toxic stuff. <laughs> and when we sand all the ships, we're trying right now to figure out how to not sand the resin, but, uh, we're, we're looking at ways to improve that so that we don't have to sand it. That's the stuff. I mean, that stuff is a nightmare to deal with. So doing the hundreds and hundreds of ships we did in resin for those Kickstarters like that is just crazy. And I wouldn't do that again. Doing regular wasn't ships. behind all your health problems for your employees, was it? <laughs> no, it wasn't, <laughs> okay. thankfully. No, I would feel really bad if it was. But, um, but no, the... Um, but it's really just dealing like, cause that just the mess it makes the amount of time it takes to cast it all doing that in a Kickstarter is just crazy. Like doing it in regular retail is fine, but doing it in a Kickstarter, it's just, I mean, the way we just burn through molds because you burn through molds much faster when you're creating, when you're making stuff at that pace, just because the, you don't, the molds don't get a chance to cool down the way they need to and all that. So, uh, I mean, it just ends up costing you more than you, that's again, one of those unexpected things you don't think about, right. Is that, so like in a lot of our Kickstarters, uh, we were going through, whereas typically we can get a mold elastis for, you know, which maybe 50, 60 uses, right? Whereas during a Kickstarter, it's probably half that. Wow. <laughs> so it's, and our, when we don't use uh, cheap silicone, we use, of course, the, the expensive platinum-based stuff that doesn't uh, deteriorate. That's why the models stay, stay good throughout the life of the mold. They don't lose any detail or anything. So, but, you know, that's again fine for day to day manufacturing that and just web orders and stuff. It's not that bad because we typically do small amounts of each ship at a time and then just go from there. But when you're having to make thousands and hundreds, it just it gets insane. But those are really the main things. Uh, I think I think we did the guys the guys who in Firelock like Steve and Alex and Lily who do all of our marketing and our and our graphics and all that. I think they did a, they've done an excellent job since they won. And really, they just get better. So we're just improving upon what they had. 
Yeah, your advertising uh, for the very first Kickstarter was very impressive. It's really pretty. Thank you. Yes, and that's had nothing to do with me. So the uh, I will pass it along. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, I think in that respect we've done well. But we've uh, uh, back then we had to. We really wanted to come out because you know we were nobody. Nobody had ever heard of Firelock or Blood and Thunder or everything, obviously, because it didn't exist. So uh, that's we had now have a, a more reliable name that we could kind of lean on to to help sell the game. You know, we've we've delivered three projects already. Uh, we've we've had other games and stuff that we've delivered outside of Kickstarter, and you know, so we you know I think people know we're going to come through and we're going to come up with something, and I think we get better every time as we go. So. Hopefully it goes really well. Well, I imagine with the plastic kit and the easy buy-in, you could easily, I don't know, I'm just guessing. I, I think you could double your uh, audience. I have friends who are really interested in the game, but they're scared by metal. Yeah. And it's complex to buy into because of the various things you need to collect. Right. But if you have one starter set, it's easy to point them to that and easy for them to just buy it. Right. Something I'm thinking about too, depending on how many things we could unlock, is doing kind of like a generic army box, right? Where it's like uh, there's one geared around militia and land forces, another one geared more around sea forces, and just it's basically it would just be a mixture of sprues, right? And uh, and then from that box you could make any you could pretty much play any European faction. So that's kind of or any, you know. Yeah, basically any European nationality, I should say. So um, that's something I'd like to see in there too, based on how the stretch goals go. That'll be one of those options where we just add that kind of as a packaging choice. Uh, but that's it. I think if we just unlock the militia, we could probably pull that off, thinking about it. But yeah. I'd like to have a model for every single different unit, but not everyone <laughs> is neurotic as me. So. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and the, we will, we will, that's the plan, right? Is to eventually be able to do that, to be able to have more specific units in plastic. Um, but because we have those specific units already in metal, it's cool because it just accents that at this point, right? So that's the thinking. So for plastic, just because there's the expense is so high, doing generic makes a little more sense. And in some cases, right, like the soldiers, there's no need for it because their uniforms are all mostly the same. And the little things that are different, we could just put it in the mold and it's an option you just glue on. So. Some models you can't proxy. Like, where are my female buccaneers? I mean, yes, that's actually can't really do that. But. That's actually on the uh, <laughs> that's actually on the list to sculpt very very soon. Actually, oh, so yeah. we might we might even see those before the end of the year. Any luck? But that'll yeah. be awesome. Yes, I so find myself um, just not playing units that there's no models of just because I I need the models, so then I just lose <laughs> out in portions of the game. <laughs> yeah, they're they're a little harder to because the thing about them is that they're so the 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 holdup with them has been getting them to cast as a single piece because of the dresses. <laughs> so that's been, uh, we kind of have some, some models that we started working with and it was just kind of problematic and we had a lot going on. So we just had to move past it, but, uh, but we are planning on them very, very soon. So as soon as we can just get past it and then, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be around soon, but they're, they're coming. <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to, I want to give the... Mitch a, a chance to um, give a quick plug for the, the vendor hall. Um, cause we actually have a virtual vendor hall for CyberCon. So Mitch, you want to explain what we got? Well, I certainly, uh, hold on. Let me make sure I'm not, on. am I mute? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can no. hear you. Yeah, can okay. Hear you. All right. Cause I had a whole commercial I had to read, you know, <laughs> tired of listening to the people from no dice, no glory drone on. Well then you're in luck. Please go hit our vendor hall where you see some great sales going on. A lot of discounts and fire lock. Join the fray in the vendor hall. If you make an order, of you get a free model um, that is unique that you would normally get if you met us at a convention. Mike, is that true? Mostly. The Mostly. Uh, I mean, I don't know what part of it's a lie, but I'm sure something you're saying is a lie because it usually is. But yeah, usually. Yeah. Um, but the uh, one of the one of the models too is the original Kickstarter Badao, Badao two pistols. That's a popular one. And we actually found some of those in a box <laughs> laying around. So grab them while you can, because those will not be made again. Will the monkey be coming back at any time in the future? I know we talked about it earlier. <laughs> oh, we really did. We've never we did. had a monkey. Yes, you did. No, we didn't. It doesn't exist. 
there oh, was so a that... statue of a monkey that had a monkey on it, but it's a yeah. it's a statue miniature. It's not a monkey miniature. Oh, it's a statue of a monkey with a miniature. Yeah, yeah it's it's all yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. then how about doing a monkey miniature? That would Why be would... a horrible blunder. Why would I do that? Oh. Huh? Why would I do that? <laughs> I I just think you. I don't know. I mean, you guys do have some of the best models. And who is mixing? It sounds like someone there is mixing a drink. Oh, that's me. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, was, oh, is that because you're on a boat? It is. Well, it's got a metal canteen too. Yeah, yeah. metal canteen. <laughs> no, I mean you. You know, like a lot of people are going back and forth here about plastics, plastics, metals, metals. You know, and I've told you this a million times. Mm -hmm. Your models, your four packs, are the best deal in 28 millimeter going, and I've told you that a million times. So. How much more would I pay for one of those packs than what you charge for it? Quite a bit, sir. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the beauty of it. They're beautiful. They're not too expensive. Well, thank you. Yeah, we, we actually probably should sell them more. We're uh, if, on, on profit levels, we're below industry standard on that. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I just feel like that's the right price to sell for. I forgot to meet my phone. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. Well, actually, um, you're officially like past the time that you you are obligated uh, politely to stick around. We'd love you to stick around. See you later, guys. Run, but you got to run. Um, well, Mike stuck around with us till what one thirty in the morning. Was it one? It was after one o'clock, wasn't it? Oh yeah. No, I don't even know. Was. That I enjoyed the hell out of that. That was a lot of fun. And we're doing another one next Friday, everybody. Another no paint beyond the line next Friday. Yeah, I have to get my unit yes. ready because if I don't get it done, I feel like I forget <laughs> what horrible thing I expect myself to. Can't I lose to two bets in a row. Yeah, I can't lose two bets in a row. I have to do it. I'm going to do it tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to do it tomorrow. And they have to okay, be on the I finished still, flute, too. They have to paint them. I put, put on the finished flute. So. Is that what we're doing? I, well, that's, no, that's what I'm doing because okay. I need to, like, I need <laughs> to regain my honor. To yeah. paint four miniatures. And he claims he's batch painting 30, so it shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> um, and I, I'm doing a commission of, of an entire French starter box for my friend. So I have to finish that so I can use the money from that commission to, to buy more models, which is... I, uh, which I, was, is I was cooking with heat with my, my subpar painting. Like I started getting back in the swing of things. My braves were almost done. So all my fire starters are almost done. Then this weekend hits, I didn't, I, I didn't touch a paintbrush, man. I wouldn't be surprised. I may be out of, <laughs> I may be out of painting again. Damn, just the way it I've, works. I've had a terrible week for painting. It has not gone well. It's just one thing after another with a toddler. <laughs> I don't have that excuse, and I just, I've been trying to clean this office for like four days. Um, I, but... I haven't painted since we did the last. Uh... No paint beyond the line or whatever it's called. I always make something. Paint. Well, then join us on Friday next week because we'll. I will. That'll be my excuse to paint because then it's work. That's what I... it's there for. So I tell my where... wife anyway. Where can they find that <laughs> link? Uh, where can they find the link for No Paint Beyond the Line? So we have started a Tales of the Sale podcast group on Facebook. The Facebook group, yeah. And we are posting is? those as events within that group. Right. Along with hopefully some polls and things like that whenever um, we're getting ready to do new episodes. Things that people would like to see covered, questions, uh, things that you want to ask during interviews with people. But that is an ongoing project, getting that up and off the ground. I think we have 1T followers right now. Yeah. So and, give I, us yeah. and I'm going to start <laughs> posting some of the stuff that I've actually painted um, you know, to compete with Glenn. So like, I, I feel like I'm not motivated unless there's some horrible consequence. I don't know what that says about me as a teacher, um, but I, do, I don't subject my students to that kind of, you know, uh, attitude, but I subject myself to it because I find well, it's motivating. Tom, I don't blame you because I feel my, I lost my mojo for painting right after um, Fallen. And I blame my lack of motivation for bringing upon COVID-19 on the earth. I can't think of... You know, it's like a Russell's teapot argument. It really kind of makes sense until you break down the science. Um, <laughs> and I put the link for everybody to go shopping um, in, the, uh, in the group chat. There are some good deals. 
I was going to ask about that because I couldn't find the vendor hall. <laughs> just he just linked it right there. Just check about it now. Yeah. Yeah. Or there's also a link where you can get HMGS merchandise. By the way, people, if you want a I wasn't there CyberCon T-shirt or Cyber Wars T-shirt, <laughs> I, I am going to see if I can. Do you have those? I am going to see if I can get them for you guys for helping out and one for Mike, so we can all wear them next time around. Awesome. But I, you want to hear something that's crazy? The number one request that they've gotten is because they've seen the, the Sarge from No Dice, No Glory. And people, some people think it's new. Can I, why can't I get that on a logo? Well, I mean, why can't I get that logo on a T-shirt? I'm like, yeah, No Dice, well, No Glory, John. The, uh, the tankers? That, like, to Mitch's credit, I remember he, he had, like, um, polo shirts made, uh, which I thought were great. But it took Mitch, like, a month's worth of coordination and wrangling people like cats to get them to finish you know, pay, paying for the shirt. So I imagine it wasn't the wonderful experience you're looking to, you know, try out again by getting all these shirts printed. <laughs> you know, I thought that, that that was my worst coordination effort. Well, other than Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I thought we were going to say Space Force. No, no, no. Space Force? It's, I was Are you in charge of that yet? No, but I helped stand up the office. But, you know, for OIF, I was one of the planners, but uh, you know, I said, you know, maybe we should do this instead. And I was overruled. But I really thought that that was the uh, hardest coordination effort was the T-shirts until <laughs> I came, until this happened. Now, this all sprang up. We started asking people Fourth of July weekend. And by the 8th, we had our schedule set. We started inviting people. So this came together really fast. But I noticed there's a lot of dudes on our staff are like, hey, man, like, where am I supposed to go? But the questions <laughs> I got asked today was, I have this ticket. Do I need to scan it on my camera, on my computer to get to the room? And I'm like, well, I don't know if that, but some of the questions were like, I don't know where the link is. I don't know how this works. Is this on television? These are actual questions. And, um, <laughs> Yeah. Well, I didn't. I didn't know, Mitch. Okay, I didn't know if it was on TV or what. I mean, well, I, I mean, I love that I got Mike's text to me, like <laughs> literally as I was yelling at an old woman over a can of paint, because she like bumped into me and then like took off her mask to yell at me at Lowe's, and I was like, "What? Like, why are you angry? Just, just take the paint. It's my gift to you. You know, I, I don't understand why you're upset. You're the one who hit me." Um, and then she just kept yelling, so I just walked away. Um, but like I literally got Mike's message, like, "Hey, where's the link?" As that was happening, um, so yeah, it was the most exciting moment of it. Otherwise, I was confused. I week. thought this was—I thought there was two separate events. Apparently, there were one event. I blame Tyler. According no, to it's, it's according my to fault. Mitch, Tyler's fault. My fault more than anybody else. Because well, we wanted to give you the option to leave <laughs> halfway right. through, and then we would just talk about you behind your back. But yeah. but we we like talking to you, so you're welcome to stick around for as long as you want. I have right. one more relevant question that I forgot to ask. Go for it. Go for it. Um, I've heard good things about some terrain that you guys are going to uh, be partnering with Foreground yes, with and right. selling off your website. Can you tell us about that? Already have. It's already on there right now. So you could go there and buy some of that cool new terrain, and then it's got the uh, you can get the miniature to go with it. Uh, so yeah, Foreground has uh, Foreground approached us a while back and wanted to work on a whole range of stuff, and they've got more coming. So they've got a Spanish range right now, mostly more? Spanish themed. Yeah, they're going to do more. He wants to do English yes. theme stuff as well and expand the Spanish one a little bit. Like I know there's a talk of a taberna, which is like a, like a kind of a bar, an outdoor bar sort of deal. So um, that's one of the things they're working on. But anyway, what they got there now is freaking awesome. If you haven't seen the foreground stuff before, like, you know, MDF terrain, I know some people aren't crazy about it because it's kind of, it tends to be kind of flat and featureless in a lot of ways but they've kind of come up with this medium solution that you can just, you just put it on with PVA glue and you spread it over and it basically gives you a stucco effect already with the colors and everything. And it looks fantastic. You look like resin buildings. This stuff uh, is gorgeous. It's it absolutely looks really, gorgeous. really good. Yeah. I, got some, I can't recommend it highly enough, really. I had some yeah, arrive this awesome. week and I'm super impressed. Yeah, yeah I've been and buying foreground stuff for the game since it came out, since Love and Thunder came out. Their stuff is so easy to put together. It yes. looks amazing. It's Great instructions. You don't have to put together. You don't have to paint anything. Yeah. 
It's, it's really not that expensive of, compared no, to it's, some it's things. Great. Yeah, it's, it's pretty affordable for what it is. They have the, the whole set. Let me see. I've got it right here. The whole set, I think, I want, I want to say it's under 200 bucks for like, I mean, and what's cool is we played on just the Quay. Like, it's just the one set that comes with everything, right? And we played a game on that. And because it's such tight quarters, it was like a legit city fight type of deal. You could actually play a 100-point game on that, no problem. And I think it's like a two by 18 or something like that is the space we played in is super tiny but it actually works really well are you talking about the ports of plunder pirate cove set that, that'd be the one you beat me to it did you 315 okay so it's a little, yeah, it's a little pricey but you get a lot trust me i mean it's like i said you can play an entire game on just what's there well i, I will say this like when you say for what you get um like in what terms of get, it's a great deal yeah because it's mdf uh, the mdx like the cut laser cut stuff like, I mean, the last convention I was actually physically at with you guys where I was running demos and stuff, um, I was looking around for 28 millimeter, you know, Caribbean terrain. It was going to be like right. my, my big purchase. And so, like, I, I dropped 200 bucks on maybe five buildings, you know, and yeah. like, the, and they're, they're gorgeous buildings, you know, they're, they're beautifully done with like separate roofs pieces and, you know, but mm -hmm. I would get the same thing. I would get, you know, five times as much terrain getting it laser cut. Uh, so and, and it's not as heavy so if you're somebody who's like setting up games or going to club games and you have to transport a lot of your own stuff around you know even even there's another reason yeah and if you even if you don't want to do the stucco on it they have um they're still colored underneath so it's not like if you don't put that on you have to paint it or anything they still have color to them so it'll still look good you know look like typical mdf terrain which still looks nice yeah, I mean, you paint it um, a little better, but you don't need to. Paint yeah, them, yeah. They, and the, yeah. But I recommend doing the stucco stuff. I know somebody posted recently that it was, they found it difficult. I found it pretty easy. I don't know. Maybe um, maybe since I was in such a hurry, I just slopped it on. But it, I thought it came out good. But uh, it was uh, – but I really like the set a lot. Like playing Blood and Plunder – that was the first time I played Blood and Plunder, like in an actual city fight where there was, you know – I mean, we, it was a really small space, but it was it, it was like playing a new game. It's really cool. It just lends itself well to like the, the way the, the, the rules work for buildings and sections and being able to move up and down. And it was like, uh, I don't know, it was pretty, it was, it was a lot of fun. I liked it a lot. So I have uh, expect some, once we, uh, once we can actually get together and play games again, we've, we've got our film set up pretty well set up. So we're going to do some, some games on that terrain with some 3D prints of the, of the new stuff coming for the 18th century. So be on the lookout for that. Yeah, just for anybody listening and looking for terrain, there's a set of three buildings, Port Hovel set for $34. This was I'll outfit you for almost right. any of the core scenarios in the rule books. Uh, nice right. structures for those different scenarios. That's, that's a great deal. It's amazing. Yeah. And I hate to undercut Mike's own products, but um, <laughs> $34 Hovel set versus the $90 Village set is uh, <laughs> quite a steal. Well, we actually, unfortunately, uh, I don't think we've act well, I don't, I don't think. We're going to actually just announce it outright, but you'll start to see a lot of our resin buildings go uh, go out of stock eventually. Unfortunately, just because again our resin production has become limited, we've kind of hit like a critical mass. So uh, until we can improve that, we're not going to be able to. We're going to keep the fortifications, but not the actual buildings. The foregrounds mm -hmm. ones supplement it, and they're really nice. So, so what you're saying is we should buy them now. Before if you want the resin buildings, go if get them now. The because yeah. no more. They are very nice. Yeah, whatever is in stock now is what we're gonna have, and they're just uh, also part of the way we actually design them to cast. We have to redesign them a little bit because they just take way too much time to make, to put together. So uh, we have to sand them, unfortunately, which was not part of the original plan, and they uh, they tend to warp when they come out of the molds. So we have to heat them and and fix them and cure them, and it's just a pain. So. <laughs> Yeah, we won't be doing those for a while. I mean, we'll, you'll probably see them come back at some point, but, um, you know, resin is just a lot more expensive than MDF, you know. It's the nature of the beast. That's why MDF is so popular these days. Well, foreground MDF is the best that I've ever worked with, so I'm glad you're working with them. Yeah, oh, for sure. And thankfully, they're, thankfully they're fans of, of our stuff, and we're fans of their stuff, so it's a good symbiotic relationship. <laughs> the video that you guys did with, I think they're on tabletop now, yeah. And it showed you hanging out with the foreground guys at the end of that. And that was hilarious because it just, the video just sort of trails <laughs> off. You guys spent so long going back and forth about the period and the. Yeah, the that game. was the whole day. When we were there that week, 
we were that was basically our day off there because that's where they filmed their that's the day they were filming their weekend there and all the stuff they have for the you know for the their their primary stuff outside of us for that week so we were just hanging out with them all day and playing we we were just there playing games and of blood and plunder and uh, blood and valor and oak and iron and stuff and with their terrain and all that and it was just good time good time all around i like those guys a lot Yeah, their videos are how I found the game and got into it in the first place. The table that they made with the um, plucked furniture foam and everything was just gorgeous. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Those videos getting a lot of hits. That's really good advertising yeah. for you guys. Yeah, thank you. So let me ask Tyler this question, and then we can kind of go around the moderator table. And Mike could answer, I suppose, but he already has them all. So like, if you were going to buy one of the forces that's coming out with the expansion, like which one are you most excited to play or try? I actually want to try playing the North American native tribes that are coming out the, uh, with the Braves and the Young Braves. I played against Jen over the weekend, a game that was sort of meant to be the Scots in Stewartstown against the Spanish or vice versa, one of the Scottish raids. And yeah, I kind of want the new natives <laughs> and I want native musketeers that don't have slow reload. So we've done that one at a con actually. Yeah. I'd love to do that one at a con. I kind of want the female buccaneers for that because I think <laughs> that it would, it'd be really cool for the Scots to just have like anyone who can carry a gun kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Probably just use them as militia, but just to mix them in and have them around. I, I think Mitch has like, I don't know how many armies completely you have for this, but you probably four. I would guess. So what, what would you possibly get if you could get whatever you wanted out of this new I could run. I could run anything except for natives and some of the Spanish lists. So I could run anything British or French, but everything's in. I, I think I told Mike I really like that Jamaican list. Um, I think I can get in trouble with a con at it. Um, like really in trouble. I, I don't mean on the gaming table, just making jokes uh oh yeah so um yeah i mean i there's a lot i'm very excited for and as i'm starting to kind of dust off some old books about uh, you know as we get closer to the 1754 french indian war and how that war was fought i i am excited to play natives against like you know some of the colonial rangers in that fight because it's just interesting and you know, growing up in, in New York and going to school in central New York, you know, that's kind of, that was the theater of operations there. And knowing that the terrain is so bad and how, how they kind of, uh, uh, you know, went into battle. I, I just, I'm very excited for the period because I can't, I, one of the things I really love about Blood and Plunder is, yeah, I'm just going to do the English. And I started playing them and I go, yeah, you know, I'm going to make a few pirate type lists. You know, these French are pretty damn good. <laughs> and, you know, and that's the beauty of the game. As long as the troops are, are armed the right way, you can kind of experiment the list without getting the specific models. I do it anyway, which is a lot like Joseph. I have OCD. And, uh, you know, it's, I, my stuff has to, it has to be that way. Um, but I think that's one of the things I'm enjoying about is that new period as we coming to, uh, you know, towards the American Revolution. That, I just think, is, is a great place to go to the game. So what list am I most excited about? Um, yeah, all of them. Uh, it's just to see how they play, you know. And I, I think I've learned something from every different faction I've played in this game of how dynamic this game is. And it was some of the lists, you know, it's, it's exponential. And I... I think it's the beauty of the game. And when I tell people that, they really kind of think I'm, I'm on crack. But then they play the game, and they said, you know, it, this game is very diverse. And there's a lot of games, I think, that fail. It's because I have a playing style, and the game will not allow me to do that. This game, it's if you don't know your playing style when you start playing it, you will know very fast. So... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't really answer the question. No, it's fine. <laughs> well, you I, know, it, I can, I can answer it for you. I can answer huh? it for you. I can answer it for you. So the uh, the raider factions and the and the uh, the 
English regulars with the provincial option. Ooh, it's basically yeah. very, that's very much the, uh, in the vein of the French and Indian War. That's the beginning of, of what kind of makes those types of troops. So, so you, all the rangers and stuff are getting their start in these sorts of groups. So, Yeah. And, you know, there's, if I could just, let me just throw on something more about the list. It is the, um, how one makes a list for land and a list for sea. Two different things. And I noticed in the game, and I, this is more of a question, is why didn't you limit what, would, what force I could put on a ship as opposed to another? Because you have the Royal Navy, the French Navy, you have right. uh, nautical factions in there, but I've seen people play totally land factions yeah, on ships it. and they wonder where they lose. <laughs> well, that's why, because if you want to, why not, right? There actually was, yeah. just, sorry, I gotta put my, uh, my mosquito cover on here because I'm getting, they're getting in my boat. Um, they're, uh, so there's, um, yeah, I mean, militias would all the time, what they would requisition private ships and go out after pirates or privateers that are harassing their local shipping just to make the problem go away, right? So uh, that's, that's basically the reason, because <laughs> it, it did happen. So if it happened, even if it happened once, we pretty much give you the option. That's why if you notice the native list that we've got, uh, the, new, the new North American native list, you can actually take size two ships. So you can actually take some sloops out there because they did capture sloops and use them against the, uh, the English and the French. All Talk sailing, North man. America, so. <laughs> and, and here's a question I want to ask everybody on the channel. Um, we had a discussion in two of the groups already today with, with the other major developers, Warlord and Battlefront, now with Firelock, I just want to bring it up again. You know, there was a thing about a social contract between developers and gamers. Gamers are very quick to point out what is wrong with any game that they love to play. I never really understood that. What I noticed about Blood and Plunder and the system as it is, I can play with whatever kind of force I can put together. There's no limitations on that. And I think that's kind of what makes the game a little bit better than a lot of other games that are on the market where you don't have those limitations given to you by the rules. It's very open. Was that something that... I don't know if I'd say a little bit. I would say dramatically. It's probably uh, the word I would use. But dramatically. I don't argue with you yet. Dramatically better. Yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's some other good games out there that you play, Mr. Tunes, and I know you do. <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't know if that's something you guys saw where, you know, you go on Facebook and you see all the complaints any game can have. Well, this should be there. That should be in there. Other than Tyler, no one ever says you guys got it wrong and this should be in the game. I don't <laughs> do that. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. We have lots of Tylers. We get people. We get, they usually email us, though. But uh, <laughs> usually it's about, typically it's about some ob obscure thing. And, and most people are nice about it. Every once in a while you get some, some arrogant person who thinks they know everything and then I just hit them with a few sources and they go away. And, but, and you, you know why I said Tyler, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, let me explain it for the rest of the audience. So the pictures Tyler showed, mm -hmm. everybody was like, you know, very brief. That's a cool skull. That looks great. Oh my God, that's awesome. Tyler, that looks great. And then comma, and I swear, okay, Tyler, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's longer than some of the articles he's written for No Dice, No Blur. <laughs> Can you, so uh, I heavily I, abbreviate I think you put those one on articles. Screen, Mitch. Huh? <laughs> I think you should put one on screen, Mitch. Can, can no, 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 I'm not. <laughs> and, 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 he, and then, like, I reply, so you like it, you know, it's like, <laughs> and I read through it and it's, it's, but in all seriousness, I don't know the history as well as you guys. And I think what I have been enjoying about playing the game, it has made me want to read a lot about the history. And then last night with Benerson, I, I didn't know who that guy was six years ago. And I've read almost all of his books. So yeah. I, I just think that it is throwing me into the history, which I love, but you know, the thing is, it's the game doesn't put too many restrictions on what players can do. And I don't know if that you guys did that by accident or on purpose, 
but very, a lot of very, games, very much intentional, yes. It was because a <laughs> yes. lot of game companies, I think they want to do it. They can't. And it's because of that OCD where it just bothers them. And one company recently came out with the fourth version of their rules, and they went to anything goes. And, I was about to comment on this. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and people I were, you could be talking about. And people were up in arms, but I said, you know, that is the way games need to start going where, hey, you play a role in this game, you know, as, as, a, as a gamer. Right. And, you know, it's, uh, but other and, than know, Tyler, but, nobody can. But Mitch, I got to yeah. say, even with them doing that, I feel like, I can't describe how, but they still managed to find a way to mess that up, <laughs> even though they opened it up. <laughs> It's not Firelock, the other company. Yeah, well, correct. Well, I, I, I will <laughs> say Firelock. this: like the, the Firelock and also Benderson Little. So, like as soon as I read Benderson Little's book, I literally logged on to Firelock's website and bought, you know, like a hundred dollars worth of stuff. Where I'm like, <laughs> wow, you know, I need this, and I need that one too, and I need this ship. Uh, and, and I'm sure, like, yeah, I, I almost could feel like Mike Tunez, like at his, you know, at his desk, seeing the order come in and being like. Tom finished the book, didn't he? I feel like <laughs> the two of them are just working together, you know. And I will say that it got me interested in the period, just like Mitch said. You know, I want to buy the force of the Raiders because I want to see the cool synergy between the native Braves and like you know French units leading them around. Because I, I love that period. And like Mitch, I'm from the same area of New York, which again is why I'm slowly becoming Mitch. But um, <laughs> I, I also plan on on literally using. Um, the blood and plunder rules to do like a unit um, in my military history class. Cause it, assuming that, you know, who knows what school's going to look like, uh, which is still an open question, but I suspect it's going to be some kind of a hybrid model where I am. And that means that there'd be some time that they'd be physically there or um, sometimes they'd be digital, but um, I get to teach military history and I can, it's my course <laughs> and I can do whatever I want. Um, so like I literally, employ a lot of war games into it and the kids usually have a blast doing it i almost have enough models to get the whole class playing one of these big you know these big things so i'll definitely write an article about it when it gets done um as i've done in the past with other things but yeah uh, promises, something, promises. I'd, I'd, something i'd like to point out actually is that we uh we actually do a bit of scholarly work on on the game so the way we approach it is uh the way you'd approach you know writing an actual history book then when it comes to the actual designing the units themselves of course that's taken into account but it's still at that point it's totally on the game end but you know so uh, as much as as much as you're proud on that a proud of that mm -hmm. when i first started playing the game because i didn't know the history it was lost on mm -hmm. me and as i'm reading more of benderson's books i'm reading more of the look we know we everybody knows we call it fluff i'm reading more of that fluff uh -huh. and i am really understanding the history and I right. would say also, too, and not to kiss your ass, because I tell you if it was broken, is that <laughs> this is a very historically accurate game. Yeah, and we, we, uh, we really pride ourselves on that. Uh, we try to really focus on that. Um, I think it's important, right? Like, and, and then to, to go back to what you were saying before about being able to kind of do what you want, that's where the whole idea of core and support units came from, right? Really core, cool. this is like what makes the army up, right? This is, this is the, the foundation of what it is. And then support, this is something, this is a type of unit that either could be there or maybe was there in smaller numbers. And it could be a stretch in a lot of cases, like, well, it's in the same general region. There's no account of them fighting together, but there's a chance. We kind of leave that, you know, because if you know anything about history, you know that, you know, we're learning new stuff every day. And I can't just come up with a rot an errata every time an archaeologist finds something new or somebody finds a new document in a historian. It's going to be complicated. So... But, uh, but you, you got to leave it a little open to interpretation, right? Um, so that's, that, that's part of the design of that. But, I mean, we, uh, my brother, who did a lot of the writing historically, Benerson, obviously, uh, Liam Taylor's now starting to do a bunch for us. Uh, and they, these guys have all, you know, they, they, do all the, they do all their homework. And they're, they're checking primary sources. They're looking at multiple angles and multiple accounts from different sides of, the, of these conflicts, you know, and we're, we're getting really good information. And uh, I think we've got a, a great, on the historical side, uh, we've got a great team that really makes that work well and is, and is exciting.
I love I love working with these guys and just with all the stuff and information I get from them is just it always blows my mind and it's just it's so cool to to be able to work on it and and it really just inspires me to work on these units and it triggers my imagination I can kind of start putting together how they fight how they act and then and, and injecting it into the world of Blood and Thunder so it's funny you say that you love working with them and I think they referred to you as a slave master but I that. <laughs> well no, I didn't say they like working with me yeah but, <laughs> I think that the coolest place where the history and forming the rules comes into play because there's obviously ball and shot which is sort of a, not really a commonly known thing but it's very obvious to players what that represents but the ruthless rule that the Spanish have comes from you guys doing the research and realizing that the Spanish are kind of like the playground bully where if they're losing, they're not so happy about it. But as soon as they have a little bit of an edge, they would like all of a sudden sink their teeth in and just beat down on people. Right, and exactly. the ruthless rule models that perfectly. Your troops are not as good as maybe they should be at the start of the game. And then once unless you start they're winning, winning yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, unless they're winning. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, now the boomerangs come back around and they're amazing. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's that was the thing. If once you start pairing filibusters with Milicianos, I can just see the filibusters <laughs> getting those first couple fatigues in, and then the Milicianos just lay into them. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> so lesson out there to anybody, really, it's not that we're bloggers; it's we're super fans. Remember that. <laughs> but you know, we play the game. And there's something that drew us to it. So. Well, we could keep going on for another uh, hour and a half. But uh, I'm getting uh, private messages here about telling some personal stories. And I can't do that with Glenn around. He gets very upset. And he'll remind me, he'll remind me about that forever. So I'm, I'm not gonna... the one that keeps bringing it up. Oh. I, feel, I feel like your definition of personal is far more personal than really anybody else in here, you know, audience included, Mitch. So I, I, I support Glenn in his censorship of you. <laughs> Oh, because I don't know what you're uh, talking about, but I support it too. <laughs> so when they start, go ahead. So when they started the um, Tales of the Sale breakoff page, and uh, the rest of us at No Dice No Glory con considered it a separatist movement, um, <laughs> what was the first comment somebody left there? <laughs> oh Jesus! Yeah, oh, it was, I, uh, I forget. Yeah, the the, uh, that was there for about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just the first comment somebody made was Mitch making some off-color remark about. Yeah, tales of the know. tale. We're going to talk about all the women in our past. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So he, uh, he, and then he was nice. He said, "Hey, man, look, it's just it's the first comment. It's right up there." So I'll just point out, I drew the short straw. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, there was a. <laughs> Who's going to tell him? There was a discussion. Yeah, yeah. The three, of, the three of us had a chat, and and I basically said like. You know, I'm, I'm in charge of the union, so I get to do this all day. So you guys get to, you guys get to be diplomatic to somebody being, I, being a good, you know. <laughs> I was surprised that it was up there that long. I thought you would pull it off and never say anything about it. No. And it was I uncomfortable for you. me. I wouldn't do that yeah. to you. No, you can. <laughs> you can. It's all good. Well, you, you outrank me, Mitch. You know. I, I, in what? In the Air Force. I'm only fake Air Force. I'm not really. And let me tell you something. Officer in the if, Air Force. Let's say COVID gets crazy. They pull me back in. I become a wing commander. You're going to be my exec. That'll be a disaster. It'll be oh, like yeah. a midway level disaster. Because they and pull Mitch back in. Or because, oh, yeah. Or, or, look, <laughs> look, let me tell you. If they're pulling me back in, I, I got some news for you. We lost. <laughs> if they're pulling you back in, who's going to lead Space Force? Not me. Yeah. Uh, Jay. Uh, what is it, Steve Carell? Yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah. So. Lord. Well, he can put it on his resume at this point, right? <laughs> I've never done yeah, that. Oh, so here we have people like you guys are a bunch of idiots. I can't believe you know this was started out so professionally. Now, now it's looking but morons. Dave Wolf. Now I just want to hang around. <laughs> yeah. So sorry, Mike. It's. <laughs> It's okay. I didn't realize staff meetings look like. If I didn't realize Mitch talk. was actually going to be allowed to talk. So I, I wasn't. Totally but, hijacked. Uh, yeah, he just. I, did, I, I, I didn't hijack. I just. You see that? I go to sleep and I fell asleep. <laughs> he asked politely, and I just let him. 
Because I know I, I know well enough from staying in hotel rooms with him that trying to keep him quiet is really a waste of your time. It's just not going to work. <laughs> no, no. Look, <laughs> so you just need to like just let him go. They, See where they, it takes you. They asked me to make some public service announcements, mm -hmm. and I had that one question, and that that was really it. And then we just started going full roundtable. This is roundtable, fellas. So. Um, yeah. All right. I'll just shut my mouth. Tell me when you stop recording so I can face this thing online. You never, you never got to me on my, my favorite faction to try. Yeah. Yeah. I want to hear, I want to hear Glenn and Joe's that what yeah. they're planning on spending a ton of money on. Mitch, Mitch took like two hours to do that part. Yeah. So Joe, what do you, what do you get? What are you doing? Well, they all look fun, but uh, I'm really excited about this. The power level of the Spanish, uh, the French Raiders that look really good. They're always good at shooting and they also have some bonuses for, charging and attacking so they look like a powerful force to play with and then on the flip side the spanish mission militia in this queen anne's war looks pretty fun too just some different ways to play to do with uh missionaries and stuff and glenn what are you getting i'm gonna buy it well, <laughs> <laughs> i think Whatever due to an is. amazon price glitch i actually picked up one of the warlord native american boxes so i'm looking forward to running those but um, honestly, I'm really looking forward to running an army unit type list where it's going to be like some kind of regulars with some grenadiers. And it's not going to be something you can do at 100 points because it's going to be like seven models. You can. <laughs> yeah, all eight models you can put on the table. <laughs> so, Mike, uh, let me ask you a related question to what Glenn just said. And um, Glenn can just pretend that we're not talking. As a designer of the game, if I wanted to defeat Glenn, um, mm -hmm. what <laughs> faction could I take to stop him? that would best pair up against that. Spanish Raiders. Or French Raiders. I've got a level with you. I don't think there's any faction I could design that could help you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think you're right. I, I, for, for the people that are just tuning in who've never heard our podcast before, I've been playing this game for a year and a half. I've, I've gotten a pretty fair number of games in, but usually at cons. I have never won a game. And I've, ne I've even, even the demos. Even the demos, I haven't, I have not won a game. So um, explain to them how you you can't add two, and how that makes that sound even worse. <laughs> this is uh, up there with the story uh, of me getting caught in a chair. The, you gotta tell the story repeated. again. Yeah, Every here's time. a personal story for everyone. <laughs> is, yeah, the other That's personal story is uh, yeah. So I, I cheated. Um, <laughs> the first con I ever went to, where I first met Mike and I first got to play this game. Um, I where they, couldn't where add, they talked me into playing. I talked you into playing. The same this, con this, I got pulled into this. Um, I didn't read the list making thing right. And so I thought that instead of like six points per unit, for, or for, per, uh, per model, for example, I thought it was per unit. And so when I added them up, I basically took every Dutch model I had in the starter box, some of which had been painted. And I said, okay, well, this adds up, you know, to, to 100 points. Like and five then points after, for four capers or something? Yeah. Instead of one? Yes. <laughs> yes. So I played the first two games um, basically with the equivalent of, I think it's around 180, 190 points worth of models. And I lost badly <laughs> in both games um, because I, yeah, because I, because terrible tactic will still lose. Um, and I, I won't even blame it on the dice. I won't, I won't disrespect my dice that way. I'll just tell you that I was terrible and I played the game horribly. But I learned a lot, picked it up quick. And by the end of the, the tourney, I was teaching people how to play um, because that's how quick you can pick the thing up. So, should have been teaching them how to add. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a social studies teacher, Mitch, so I don't need to worry about that. The computer does it for me. It's going to lean on that as heavily as I can. So, we have, we have some tournament organizers in here, and David Wolf is saying that uh, the next time he's at a tournament, he would like Tom as his opponent. As the likely together. TO, I will take yeah. grudge matches. That's, that's fine, yeah. That's I'm not a grudge. You ever. <laughs> we can make it into a grudge. You just gotta, you gotta figure out some kind of grudge, Dave, and you, can, you get it going. I love playing Dave Wolf, man. He's one, he's one of the best guys. <laughs> I mean, he's of, a good player. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, I had, uh, we had, you had that promised game of, uh, I was going to throw the poisoned arrows at you at Gen Con. What are we going to yes. do about that now? Uh, I, well, here's a, here's a thing that we're, we're looking into some technology that lets, uh, that allow us to 3d scan stuff, paint like 3d scan painted models and uh, kind of make stuff that 
you wouldn't be able to print on a 3D printer, which is one of, always kind of one of our worries mm. with a uh, tabletop simulator. But yeah, Blood and Thunder on tabletop simulator is something that we're hoping to start working on uh, maybe next month. And nice. uh, so you might see that. So maybe we can try it on tabletop simulator. I mean, so. there are companies that release like like premium content on it, where you give like the very very basic game, and then they pay the extra for the factions or whatever that are. And like, right. I mean, I'd pay for that. Like yeah, the value I got out of that stuff is pretty high. The the developers I think are just slammed with work right now because oh yeah because because we've is... I've reached out to them multiple times and all they just told me was we're busy and uh, we want to do your game we'll get to you at some point basically yeah and I've every time I've checked in it typically takes them weeks to respond to me. So at this point, I've given up on that, and uh, just we're gonna just do it ourselves, or at least attempt to. I don't know if we'll be able to actually pull it off. We don't have any people with the actual expertise, um, but uh, they've they've uh, Lillian Figueroa, our our graphic artist, and and Daniel, our uh, our sculptor. Between the two of them, they've kind of just put their heads together and, and sorted it out. We've had a few people help us. We've watched YouTube videos like that's how everybody learns things these days right just trying to figure it out in between our regular work so um, we don't really have the time to work on it but I just feel like it's an important thing right now to do Um, and I think it would be cool to be able to put some of those things into uh, that we're going to have in the Kickstarter on there so people can try it out and with along with the Queen Anne's World book and you'll have the models and you can actually play with those virtually uh, but uh, I can't make any promises. I don't know if we will pull it off. Oak and Irons, it's Oak and Irons a little bit more uh, on rails, and it's you know we could just do a handful of ships, and it kind of works. Blood and Thunder has so much more models involved and so much more things. It's a little more complex, but um, yeah, we're gonna try. Oh, thank going. you for your work on that Oak and Iron. That was amazing. It was really yeah, it really looks beautiful on table. Thanks. I didn't do anything. Oh yeah, I didn't do anything didn't except anything complain on. about things that didn't work on it. So that's that was my extent. <laughs> I was just basically a typical project manager. I just said, yeah, do this. And then people did it. So, uh, <laughs> and they did great. So Lillian and, and Daniel were the, the main ones who really contributed a lot toward that. And uh, some people in the community helped a little bit too and gave us some cool resources that improved upon what we had. So that was awesome. But, uh, you know, if anybody's out there and watching and feels and knows, and knows some programming or some other things and wants to uh, contribute, you know, we will take all the help we can get. <laughs> so I think we're, we're going to close down our recording portion of it um, and and just thank Mike again for joining us. Um, I really appreciate here. you making the time from your secure and closed boat. <laughs> um, I'd remind people that um, if they want the free mini and some of the deals they have to order during the, the convention frame window. Um, so you'd have to get your orders in um, before the end of the day Sunday. And if you want to check out um, more Firelock stuff. I believe Rufus is on tomorrow to talk specifically about um, Blood and Valor. Blood, Blood and Valor, Valor expansion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was going to ask. Uh, I was going to ask Mike for some uh, guidance here. Uh, Steve Murga asked to uh, uh, be my co-chair when we interview him. Absolutely. Yeah. And I said, <laughs> so Steve you might want to. You might want to make that one like a PG thirteen rating though. Yeah, and then Rufus together. So Steve told me he hasn't updated his personal computer in like six years. Oh lord! <laughs> and he's like, "Well, why don't I just I come over that. and we do it together?" I go, "You can sit on my lap." So uh, he so will. I, He'll sit on your lap the whole time. I may have Murga here tomorrow, but I'm looking forward to that. Oh, I'll be and, here. Uh, I gotta. I can't miss that. Cool. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sign up for that because I want to hear. I want to hear about it uh, too. That'd be great. All right. So I thank you guys for joining. Everything. So. Um, and we'll we'll cut it there, and we will upload this to YouTube for those of you that tuned in for part of it. You want to rewind and listen to the whole thing, and we'll be posting that as soon as we have it processed. So thank you very much.